Joining me now is former U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Karen Kwiatkowski, who has served as a Pentagon desk officer and in a variety of roles with the National Security Agency, but she's best known for her role in speaking out against the political corruption of the intelligence community in the United States by our government regarding the war in Iraq. She's written extensively at lewrockwell.com for the American Conservative and for Salon.com and is now a candidate for the Republican nomination to represent Virginia's 6th Congressional District. Karen, thank you so much for joining us and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm shocked that we haven't had a chance to, uh, to meet in person given, given our respective career paths, so to speak. But uh, I, I want to start with, with your, your military service, if we can, because uh, our, our viewers are, uh, have, have heard from the perspective of a sergeant, myself as, as, a, as a Marine in Iraq, but your perspective as a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force in the intelligence community gave you a really unique perspective on how our government carried out the war in Iraq. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, it was in the 19th year of my 20s, so I had some military experience before I was really exposed to how uh, the Pentagon and really makes decisions on what to do. Um, I had uh, I expected it to be bureaucratic and I expected it to be filled with waste because I had seen that in 19 years and I kind of, I guess, accepted that. But uh, that last year, uh, working at the Office of Secretary of Defense uh, in the Near East South Asia Directorate, I got to see how, you know, how the agenda is set. And it has nothing, at least in that case, had nothing to do with uh, security of the United States. Uh, the, the great um, infrastructure of the Department of Defense and the great infrastructure and, and budget of our intelligence departments weren't used to find out what was really happening. They weren't used to uh, further Americans, uh, American defenses. It was, it was used as a kind of a, a, uh, a field to pick little bits and tiny bits of information here and there that could be fed up into the political chain used to, and used to justify by politicians and by the appointed uh, leaders of the Pentagon uh, to justify a decision really that they had already made. And that decision, of course, in 2002 was, was the decision to invade and occupy Iraq. Um, you know, the, the, the intelligence uh, infrastructure and all of the hard work of all those good people that wear the uniform and the civilians, their work was used to further a very different agenda than what they thought they were working for. And, and I think I was, I was a little bit, um, well, I was certainly dismayed and I was very shocked also. So this is, I mean, something that's been talked about for years now, and, and I just want to commend you for the work that you've done in, in taking your experience and, and contributing it to Americans' understanding of how the war in Iraq got started. But while most Americans seem to have come to agreement on the point that the war in Iraq was, it, at very least, a bad idea, there still seems to be a, a large dispute over what are the lessons to be learned from that? What then should we do? How should we conduct our foreign policy? How should the national defense be organized? So tell us a little bit about how you've developed a, a philosophy or, or, or a concept about that based on your experience. Well, it, it caused me to, to look back at uh, some of the writings of the founders, to look back into the Constitution. You know, every, and you know this, uh, every time we, re-up or whatever we, we say our oath uh, to uphold the Constitution, but so many people really don't read it, and certainly the Congress doesn't read it. In our Constitution, there is a process uh, by which this country will go to war. And that process was not followed. I think if, if the process had been followed in the case of Iraq, we would have seen in the Congress, uh, and even amongst the bureaucracy, I think we would have seen a great deal more discussion. I think the truth would have come out uh, in terms of what the agendas were, okay, and also what the threat was or was not. Uh, you know, a lot of people to this day, if they didn't serve in Iraq, if they didn't study this topic, what they remember is that the president of the United States and the vice president and the secretary of state all said things about, you know, Saddam Hussein's, uh, you know, participation in 9-11 and support of al-Qaeda, both things later retracted by those people, known to be true even at the time they said them. But, you know, the average person 
figures that the president tells the truth, the vice president tells the truth, the secretary of state tells <laughs> the truth. And, and they don't. They, they don't. And, and the founders understood that people would be flawed, that political leaders would be would, would not be the best of men, the best of women. And so they set forth this constitution. So my take from it all is we don't follow the constitution in this country. Had we done so in 2001, 2002, the world would be a different place. Um, and so I think that the, the solution is simply to go back to how we were set up to operate and, and rigorously and devotedly uh, operate in that manner. But there's something more to, I, I think, how you've been affected by your experience and your soul searching, if you will, since your service in the military, because obviously it, it caused you to question a lot of your own understanding of, of, of the world. How has that really affected your political philosophy? And let me just explain what I mean by that, because you, you, you get back to the Constitution in a way that, that almost sounds like that's the practical answer, but there are some deeper ideas and philosophies behind that document. How, how have your experiences gotten you to, a, to a, a philosophical point that might be different from what you had when you were in the service that, that affects your worldview today? Yeah, um, I have had a ph philosophical shift, uh, and it actually started before 2001, 2002. Uh, mm. When the Cold War ended in 1989, 1990, 91, uh, my expectation was, as a Cold Warrior, okay, as it were, my expectation was that the United States military uh, would contract in many ways that bases that we had overseas, particularly in Europe, would uh, almost immediately be dismantled and come home, and that the mission uh, of the military would, would change drastically in accordance with what we now knew uh, about the threat, and certainly with no Soviet Union. Really but ironic, if, excuse me, sorry, but really <laughs> ironic, because I, I, I went through the exact same thing, I guess on a smaller scale coming back from Iraq, even though I was there in 2004 as part of the, the cleanup, the, the rebuilding process already at that point, it was like, after the Battle of Fallujah, I really expected there to be a lot less troops replacing us than, than we were coming home at that time. And, and then it was like, well, well wait, wait a second. We're getting a surge and, and another surge and, and another surge. <laughs> That's right. And, and you've discovered the secret of, you know, of the executive uh, military of this grand bureaucracy of the military industrial complex that we have in this country today. When a uh, legitimate mission or even an illegitimate, but an accepted mission dries up, goes away, is, is perhaps we have success, as, as you might say in the Cold War. You could say, well, we won that one. Um, in fact, we, we never get smaller. We just ratchet it up and get bigger. And we look for new missions, which we certainly did after the Cold War. Uh, in fact, in fact, one of the missions that we found uh, under Herbert Walker Bush, George, George Bush 41, of course, was, uh, you know, the, the first Gulf War, which set the stage certainly for uh, your tour, your you know your deployment there in 2004, and uh, what may or may not be coming to an end at the end of this year. Th these missions, this seeking of mission, this uh, expansion of mission, it's the nature of bureaucracies. It's the nature of the state. And I began to look into what is the state, what is the nature of government, what should it be. And of course, I looked to the Constitution, but I also read a lot more. Um, uh, you know, I, certainly I write for LouRockwell.com. I read a lot of the stuff that uh, Lou Rockwell publishes. I read things about uh, Austrian economists and, and the way that they viewed the, the interworkings of, of people, uh, both as individuals, as communities, and the role of the state and how the state tends to function. It's a really scary thing. So, yes, I, I do not trust uh, any state farther than I can throw it, okay? <laughs> and, and, I, and I don't... Uh, I, I think it has to be very carefully watched. And, and I think I'm probably way more conservative than Eisenhower was in his farewell address when he talked about an alert uh, and, and uh, informed citizenry. It's, an even, it's even not enough to be alert and informed. We have to substantially reduce the size of the federal government. Now, I would say state governments as well, but certainly in, in the race that I'm in, my agenda, my focus is to do everything that I can to both make people aware of the dangers of a, of a well-funded state and also to reduce the uh, size of the federal government. It has to be done. It's, it's not only right that we do it. It's not only in the American tradition, certainly back to the founders, that we do it, but it is necessary to the very survival of our way of life. If, 
our government is way too big. It interferes with, I mean, every aspect of our lives. And, you know, it's only going to get bigger. We have to actually creatively and, and through hard work and dedication, like much like you're doing, you know, inform people and break the state, break most of it, okay? There's a little bit of the role. I will admit that the Constitution lays out a few functions. I think we should get back to those functions. And now you're running to represent Virginia's 6th Congressional District. And while there have been numerous attempts within the Republican Party to get it back to the Constitution and get it back to its own platform as opposed to the neoconservative hijacking of the leadership, but also the neoconservative subversion of the base, ideologically speaking, to accept candidates like Mitt Romney and Rick Perry. Uh, but we have candidates like Ron Paul who have been doing that to various degrees of success. And you actually have a really unique opportunity because you're in a district where we have a, a Republican-leaning district, right? Because that's always hard to overcome, uh, you know, if, if you get the nomination for the minority party. But you're running against a man in the primary who is a, is it 10-term incumbent? He's in his, he's in his 10th term right that's, now. That's almost 20 <laughs> years in Congress. I don't care what party you are. Uh, you, know, you know, that's, that's, that's a, a long time to be in a position without, without any kind of break in it. And um, th this guy is not just like Mitt Romney or, or Rick Perry able to sort of dance around their liberal neoconservative tendencies. You're running against a guy who, um, who, who voted for the bailouts, is that right? I mean, isn't that, wasn't that supposed to be a fireable offense for any Republican in Congress? Yeah, there there are some votes where he voted um, against it. I, I know there was one bailout he voted against, but um, he supported uh, well, every... one bailout. It's sort of like it's yeah. sort of like how many murders before a guy gets arrested. Well, <laughs> oh, he, he, he didn't right. murder this guy. He didn't. That's but no, right. one bailout, one bailout vote no, is he, enough, right? He voted. Uh, absolutely. And he's he's voted. Uh, you know, he served both in Republican and Democratic administrations, certainly under the Bush administration. Uh, he never saw a budget that he didn't vote for. He never saw. A, a, a debt ceiling uh, increase that he didn't vote for. Uh, once uh, Obama came in, of course, you know, the Republicans said, oh, we don't like this. But actually, they like the big state. They like to spend money. And this guy voted for several of Obama's budgets, uh, including, including uh, you know, those that funded Obamacare, which our own state here in Virginia had filed lawsuit against. So that, that right there is, is, there's no excuse for that. I mean, did he not know that we were opposed to that in the state? Right. But, um, he also voted uh, most uh, recently this summer to raise the debt ceiling by 2.4 trillion or whatever it was. And um, you know the the message from our very conservative district is is one of fiscal conservatism, and we don't appreciate all this waste of money. Uh, well, I, hold on, I was going to say because that's that's what you're really up against. It's not the government that's the challenge here. It's really the mentality and the paradigm of the Republican primary voters in your district. And to be fair, they have as much been a part of the problem having sent this guy back to Congress nine times after seeing the true. kind of representative he was. It's true. It's true. Uh, we certainly, uh, in the 6th District, have sent a Republican, well, the only one that was offered to us up until, up until my candidacy. Uh, we've, set, we've sent the Republican back up there. Uh, the idea, I guess, is that he's a lesser evil. Um, in any case, there aren't enough Democrats, independents, or anybody else to elect an alternative. Uh, so this is one of the reasons that we're going up against him in the primary, because on principle, I represent much more closely what the Republicans uh, here in this district feel than he does. So uh, so we have we actually have a really, well, first off, it's a lot of fun. It's going to be a great race. It is already. Um, but I think we're going to beat him. And uh, we're going to beat them for the right reasons. The Republicans are not going to have to change their minds. They're simply now going to have a choice. Uh, do you want small government? Do you want fiscal conservatism? If you do, uh, you have a choice. And that, that would be uh, to, you know, to vote for me. And, and I think they will. Well, you're having a money bomb tomorrow, October 28th. I want to encourage uh, our viewers to get out, get on the interwebs. What's, what's the website? It's uh, KarenKforCongress.com. KarenKforCongress.com. Karen we'll have that up in the description of the video as well. Uh, yeah, the Money Bomb is, is tomorrow, but we'll, we'll, of course, 
this video will be up for people to get a perspective on your campaign well into the future. I wish you the best of luck. And uh, I, I hope that the, the message of liberty is well received by the Republican primary voters in Virginia's 6th District. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thanks for the good work that you're doing, too. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen Kotowski, former U.S. Air Force intelligence officer and candidate for Virginia's 6th Congressional District.